Hey, what's up? The Cabinet Vision Guy here with another video podcast. So, I recently came across an e-support post asking about getting an image of a news broadcast in a television. Now, one way we can do this is create a new material that we can use in Cabinet Vision and assign it to the objects we want in Cabinet Vision. Now, if you want to use the pre-built objects that come with Cabinet Vision, this can be a little bit more difficult. On top of that, if you have a central or standard, then this might not even be an option for you. With that in mind, I figure I would go ahead and take a look at another option, which would be kind of like green screening. I have my Mac showing, and I made this image in Cabinet Vision using the PhotoVision add-on. I found this image of an NBC show, and I want to merge them both together, basically putting the TV show on the TV. To do that, let's open my favorite image editing app, Photoshop. Once that's open, we can just open our main image by going to File, then Open. We just need to find the image, select it, and click on Open. Before we get to editing though, we have to do some prep work. It's pretty simple, but you can see that the layer we need to work with is locked. This is because it's a flat image that we opened up. To fix that, we just need to click on the layer and then drag it onto the New Layer button. This created a new Photoshop layer that we can now edit. Next, since we will be cutting something out, I need to hide the background layer. I did this because what we're doing is a non-destructive way to edit our image, and we have a backup copy in case we mess something up. Now we can get to editing. I want to remove this blank screen here. Why I want to remove it will become apparent later on, so just bear with me at this point. To remove it, we could grab the eraser tool and erase it like that, but that would be time consuming. Uh, we could also use the color range selector to select the color but there are a few pieces of the bezel that are too close to the screen color for that. So we'll just use the rectangle select tool provided to us. Because the camera was angled when I rendered this image, we can see that a perfect square selection box isn't going to work. But it's what we're gonna start with. You don't need to worry about the size of the selection, just make a simple one. Now, while we have the rectangle selection selected, we just right click in the work area and select transform selection. This will give us the ability to alter the selection box to suit our needs. I want to start with a distort transformation. This will allow us to move the vertices of the selection rectangle to the corners of the TV. I just need to get them close. And then I can zoom in and get it as close as possible without removing any of the bezel. Now we just press enter on our keyboard to confirm our transformation. From here I could press the delete key on our keyboard to remove this. But as I said before, we really want to work in a non-destructive manner. So what I will do instead is mask the screen out. If I try to mask this out right now, the screen will remain and the rest of the image will vanish. This is because creating the mask will leave all items that are selected shown. To correct this is a simple thing. We just press the command key, the shift key, and the letter I on our keyboard. On a Windows computer, this would be the control key, the shift key, and the letter I. This inverted our selection so that everything else is selected and the screen is not. You can tell because the outline of the image is selected as well as the screen. Next, we just click the add layer mask button and whammo, it's gone. On our layer, you can see that there is a new item on the layer. This is the mask itself. If I right click on the mask, I can disable it to bring the screen back and I can right click on it again to remove it once again. Now that the screen is gone, we can place our show image. We just go to file and select place. Now we find our image we want to use, and there it is, covering our image. Since we just placed it, it is in the transform mode. We just need to press enter and see that, well, it's still not in the TV. That's because it's on top of the TV. No, really, see in the layers, there it is, on top of the TV. I just need to move the layer that it's on down to beneath it, and done. Well, not, not quite, but it's now in the TV. It's not lined up correctly, and it's too big, so we're going to go back to doing some transform. Just go to Edit, and select Free Transform, making sure that this layer is selected. Then we right-click and select Distort again. We don't have to be nearly as precise this time. In fact, I'm just going to make sure that the layer is totally behind the bezel of the TV so that it's got a good overlap. I 
I do want the overlap to be fairly even though, so that Photoshop will scale my image properly. So let me go ahead and do that real quick. Now that we have the image placed, I kind of want to add a little bulge there as the TV is actually an old CRT style television. For that we go back to transform. This time we will be using the warp transform. This will allow us to warp the image to where we need it to be. I will just go ahead and add a little bulge in certain spots. This is kind of unnecessary but it will give us a little bit more realism. Excellent. The final step of getting this done will be to add a little light to the show image to reflect Cabinet Vision's lighting that was used during the render. For this, we want to use a lens flare filter. To accomplish that, we just need to go to the filter menu, go to the render submenu, and click on the lens flare command, which gives us the lens flare dialog. This is pretty simple to use. Just move the mouse cursor to where you want the center position of the lens flare to be and click. I want this to be closer to the top right of the screen, so I will click and actually drag the uh, crosshair over to the approximate area that I want. Next, I want to switch from a 50 to 300 millimeter zoom to a 105 prime flare, as this gives a more generic white color for the flare. Finally, I really don't want this flare to be too powerful, so I'll just reduce the brightness to 50% and then click OK. You can see that the flare here meets up pretty well with the reflectiveness of the bezel on the TV. This will give the image a little more realism towards being an actual TV monitor screen. I still have some more reflectiveness, so I will go ahead and add another flare on the left of the screen as well. I pretty much want the same settings, just in a different location. I'm going to place it well off of the image this time, which will render only a small portion of the flare which is fine for what we want, so we can just click OK, and finally, we're done. You see, it really didn't take us long at all to get that image there. Using Photoshop, we can easily remove whatever we want and add in something else with ease. This allows me to focus my use of cabinet vision on engineering my cabinets, furniture, and closets, and adding a little bit of extra wow factor to the presentation afterwards in something like Photoshop or another similar image editing software. This would allow me to take, say, this image and convert it into this in a matter of minutes. So that was pretty quick. I think I still have some time to talk about a really powerful but very rarely used feature of Cabinet Vision for reporting. And that's using a structured query language or SQL statement to create views in the report.mdb. I had glanced over SQL in previous podcasts, but hadn't really gone over how we can use them in Cabinet Vision. Well, it's that time now. This is going to help us refine our data when we create our reports without having to rely on custom select statements in Crystal Reports. To get started on that, let me go to my Windows computer where I have Microsoft Access open right now. We can see that I've already opened the report.mdb and that I have the list of all the tables here on the sidebar. I can use an SQL query to create a view that I can report on. Now I don't create it here, rather I want Cabinet Vision to create it at runtime, meaning when I go to the Report Center, Cabinet Vision will create the view. There are a few steps we have to work with before we want to get started on that though. What I've already done is create a dummy report that I use to create all of my views that I will use to create my reports with. Let's find that report first by going to the reports table. Now it's a more recent report that I created so I will organize the table by the report ID number in an ascending order. I just need to right click on the column header and select sort smallest to largest. Now we just scroll down to the bottom. You know, I, I guess I could have sorted largest to smallest to get to it, but yeah, whatever. Anyways, there it is. Now we need to remember the ID number of that report. This is what Cabinet Vision will use to determine if it needs to create a new view or not. For me, it's 311. It may be different for you if you've added a dummy report. If not, you'll have to do that, and I'll tell you how to do that in my notes after the podcast. So, we can close this table, and then open the Report Queries table. We can see that it's blank, so there are no reports in my database that use a select query to generate any views at runtime. 
which is what you should expect to see. Let's go ahead and make a simple one real quick. So I will need to enter that report ID number. That was 311. Now I have to give the view a name. This is how it will be referenced in our report. Now make absolutely sure that you don't use a table name that is already in the report.mdb, like parts or job info or something like that, as Cabinet Vision will then reject the SQL. I will call this custom door table, all one word. Next, we can create our SQL statement. I want to start with something simple, so I will say select star from doors. For a quick breakdown, this is telling Cabinet Vision to select all of the fields that it finds in the door table. And that's it. Let's close access and see what's going to happen in Cabinet Vision. I have a job open, so let's just go to the report center. Nothing's loaded yet, but you can see I have my dummy report listed in the sidebar. If I click on it, it just loads a simple part list with no formula set. Now I will provide a sample.rpt file in my notes that can be used instead of this, which will make the views load more quickly. Anyways, we can now leave the report center and go to the report.mdb file. We had to leave the report center because a lock file is created while we're in the report center to prevent us from opening and altering the data while viewing the report. Now, whenever you open the report.mdb, Access is going to want to upgrade the database. Make sure that you always click no. Cabinet Vision expects the database to be in a certain format and that's all it will accept. Next, it tells us that this is an old database format. We will just click OK on that, considering it's the only option we can actually click. OK, so we see the tables and now there's a new, I want to say permanent, but it's kind of temporary. Hmm. Let's, let's call it a temporarily permanent view here at the bottom of the list. It will stick around in the database until the next time we go into the report center. Because of this behavior, we can now design a report based on this table or view. We would just open crystal reports, create a new report, then connect to the database and find the view under the views in the database. Now the SQL select statement that we use doesn't really do anything other than copy the table exactly. It does give us some good groundwork to start with though. We can use any SQL select statement to filter out any number of items creating a table or view that has exactly the data we want. For instance, let's say that I only wanted a table with drawer fronts in it. I could make a select statement like select star from doors where type equals DF. Now you might be thinking, well, I could just do this with a group selection formula for the report. And you would be right, you could. But Cabinet Vision may change that formula based on what filter you have applied as well as what information you have specified in that group selection formula. Basically, this just gives us another layer of data manipulation to get what we want. So here's the time that I typically thank Hayfula, but uh, I do want to take a moment for some shameless self-promotion. <laughs> As you very well may know, the Association of Woodworking and Furnishing Suppliers, or AWFS, is having their biennial fair in Las Vegas, Nevada. As you can see by this logo, I will be speaking there. Actually, I'll be speaking there three times a day each day. Now, it's going to be the same stuff each time, so if you miss one, no worries, because you can hear it again later. So if you make it to the show, come on by booth 4413 and you can meet me talk to me about things that we can do to make Cabinet Vision help your business, and even meet other people to help you out. So with that said, thanks to Hayfula for sponsoring this podcast, and as usual, here's this week's quote. <laughs>